Chapter 34 When Dr. McKee arrived early on his rounds, Jake was standing in the center of his room with his hands raised halfway above his head. His gown was lying across his bed and he wore a t-shirt and bulky sweatpants, the largest pair Carla could find. And he was wearing running shoes, as if ready for a morning jog. What are you doing? McKee asked. Stretching. I'm leaving. Sign the papers. Sit down, Jake. He backed onto the bed and sat on the edge. The doctor gently unwrapped the gauze around his head, probed his stitches, and said, We'll get these out in a week or so. Not much else to do with your nose but let it heal. It reset nicely and won't have much of a bend to it. I really don't want a crooked nose, Doc. You'll have more of a rugged look, McKee replied like a smart ass as he pulled off the last of the gauze. How are your ribs? Still there. Stand up and drop your pants. Jake did so and gritted his teeth as the doctor examined, quite delicately, his testicles. Still growing, he mumbled. When can I have sex? Wait till you get home. Seriously. Coupla years maybe. I'll release you, Jake, but you must take it easy. This will not be a quick recovery. Take it easy. What else can I do? I can barely walk with these things. Carla eased into the room as Jake was pulling up his sweatpants. I'm out of here, he said proudly. Take him home, McKee said to her. But he stays in bed for the next three days, and I mean it. No physical activity at all. And we're cutting back on the Vicodin. That stuff's addictive. I want to see you Monday. He left and Carla handed Jake a newspaper, the Times from the day before. A bold headline announced. Brigance attacked, hospitalized. Front page again, she said. Just where you want to be. Jake sat on the edge of the bed and read Dumali's sensational account of the beating. No suspects had been identified. No comments from the victim or his family or anyone in his office. Ozzy said only that it was still under investigation. There was a stock photo of Jake entering the courthouse during the Haley trial. A nurse brought some paperwork and a bottle of Vicodin. Only to a day for the next five days, and then that's it, she said as she gave the bottle to Carla. She left and returned with a fruit shake and a straw, his usual breakfast. An hour later an orderly pushed a wheelchair through the door and asked Jake to have a seat. He declined, said he wanted to walk out. The orderly said no, hospital procedure required all patients to leave in a chair. What if a patient fell and hurt himself again? He'd probably sue, you know. Especially a lawyer. Just sit, Jake, Carla snapped. She handed him a cap and his sunglasses and said, I'll get the car. As the orderly pushed him out of the room and along the hallway, Jake said goodbye to the nurses and thanked them for their help. He rode the elevator down and was at the front entrance when he spotted Dumali lurking near the door with a camera. Duma approached him with a smile and said, Hello, Jake, got time for a comment. Jake kept his cool and said, Duma, if you take a photo of me right now I swear I'll never speak to you again. Duma didn't touch his camera but asked, any idea who did it, Jake? Did what? Attack you. Oh that. No, no idea and no comment. Get lost, Duma. You think it's related to the Kofor case? No comment. Get lost. And don't touch that camera. A security guard appeared from nowhere and walked between Jake and the reporter. The wheelchair was rolled through the wide front doors and Carla was waiting at the curb. She and the orderly eased Jake into the front seat, closed the door, and as they drove away Jake flipped Duma the bird. Was that really necessary? Carla asked. Jake did not reply. She said, look, I know you're in a lot of pain, but you're being rude to people and I don't like it. We're about to be cooped up in the house together and you're going to be nice to me. And to Hannah. Where is this coming from? Me, the boss. Just chill out and be nice. Yes ma'am, Jake said as he chuckled. What's so funny? Nothing. I'm not sure you're cut out to be a nurse. I am most certainly not. Just keep the bedpan warm and the pain pills coming and I'll be super nice. They rode in silence as they approached the square. Who's at the house? He asked. Your parents are there with Hannah. No one else. Is she ready for this? Probably not. I made the mistake of looking at myself in the mirror this morning. My little girl will be horrified when she sees her father. 
Purple, puffy eyes, cuts and bruises, a nose the size of a potato. Just keep your pants on. Jake started laughing and felt like crying at the same time as his ribs screamed. When he managed to stop, he said, most nurses have great compassion. I'm not feeling it here. I'm not a nurse. I'm the boss and you'll do what I say. Yes, ma'am. She parked in the drive and helped him get out. As he waddled across the patio, the rear door opened and Hannah ran out. He wanted to grab her and squeeze her and whirl her around, but he bent low for a peck on the cheek. She had been warned and didn't try to hug him. How's my girl? He asked. Great, daddy. How are you? Much better. In a week I'll be as good as new. She took his hand and led him inside where his parents were waiting in the kitchen. He was already exhausted and lowered himself into a chair at the breakfast nook, where the small table was covered with cakes, pies, platters of cookies, and flowers of all varieties. Hannah pulled a chair close to him and held his hand. He chatted with his parents for a few minutes as Carla poured coffee. Hannah said, are you going to take off those sunglasses? No, not today, maybe tomorrow, but how can you see in here? I can see your beautiful face just fine and that's all that matters. Those stitches are gross. How many do you have? Tim Bostick cut his arm last year and got 11 stitches. He was so proud. Well, I've got 41, so I beat him. Mom says you lost two teeth. Let me see. Carla scolded. Hannah, that's enough. I said we're not going to talk about this stuff. Judge Noose was up in Tyler County, in the courthouse at Gretna, going through another dreary civil docket call, staring at a list of active cases that no judge anywhere would want to preside over. The plaintiffs, lawyers were half-heartedly pushing for trials while the defense lawyers were using their standard delay tactics. He called for recess and retired to his chambers, where Lowell Dyer was waiting with a copy of the Ford County Times. Noose took off his robe and poured a cup of stale coffee. He read the article and asked, have you talked to Jake? No, have you? No, I'll call him this afternoon. I've spoken to his wife, and I chatted with his law clerk, Portia Lang, at his office. Any idea who's behind it? I talked to Ozzy. He swore me to secrecy, said it's some of the Kofers, but Jake refuses to press charges. Sounds like Jake. Me, I'd want the death penalty. But you're a prosecutor. What does this do to venue? You're asking me. You're the judge. I know, and I'm trying to decide. I think Jake has a point. My sources in Clanton tell me it's a hot topic and picking a jury might get complicated. Why run the risk on appeal? Does it really matter to the state where we have the trial? I don't know. Where would you move it? Well, I'd certainly keep it in the 22nd. You could pick the same jury in the other four counties. But Ford County worries me. Bring it here. Noose laughed and said, what a surprise. You'd like it in your own backyard, wouldn't you? Dyer thought about this and took a sip of coffee. What about the Kofers? They'll be upset if you move it. They're not in charge, are they? And they're gonna be upset by everything that happens. I gotta tell you, Lowell, I'm really bothered by what happened to Jake. I forced the case on him and now he's been beaten to within an inch of his life. If we tolerate this, then the whole system starts to break down. With Ford and Tyler out of the running, that left Polk, Milburn, and Van Buren counties. The last place Dyer wanted to try a big case was in the old courthouse in Chester, Noose's home. He had a hunch, though, that that was where it was headed. He said, Jake will be on the sidelines for a while, judge. You think he'll ask for more time, want a continuance. The trial is seven weeks away. I'll ask him this afternoon. Will you object if he asks for more time? No, not under these circumstances. But the trial will not be that complicated. I mean, there's no question about who pulled the trigger. The only sticky part is the insanity issue. If that's where Jake is headed I need to know soon so I can send the boy back to Whitfield for an evaluation. Jake needs to make a decision. Agreed. I'll bring it up. Just curious about something, judge. How did Jake convince the jury that Haley was insane? I don't think he did. Haley wasn't insane, not under our definition. He carefully planned those killings and knew exactly what he was doing. 
It was nothing but retribution, plain and simple. Jake won by convincing the jurors that they would have done what Haley did if given the chance. It was masterful. He may have trouble doing it this time. Indeed. Every case is different. After two hours at home, Jake was bored. Carla pulled the shades in the living room, unplugged the phone, closed the door, and ordered him to rest. He had a stack of pink sheets, as they were commonly known, advanced copies of the state Supreme Court rulings that every lawyer claimed to dutifully read immediately upon publication, but his eyes wouldn't focus and his head ached. Everything ached, and the Vicodin was proving less effective. He napped periodically but it wasn't the deep sleep he needed. When his nurse peeked in to check on him, he demanded the right to go to the den to watch television. She reluctantly agreed and he changed sofas. When Hannah passed through and saw his face without the sunglasses, she bent low for a better look and started crying. Soon he was starving and insisted on a bowl of ice cream for lunch. Hannah shared one with him, and as they were watching a western the doorbell rang. Carla took care of it and reported that it was a neighbor, one they barely knew and rarely saw, who wanted to say hello to Jake. A lot of people wanted to stop by but Jake was adamant. The swelling around his eyes would last for days and the colors would go from purple to black and blue. He had seen this in football locker rooms and he had seen it several times with clients charged in honky-tonk brawls. A depressing range of dark and ominous colors was creeping through his face, and the show would go on for a couple of weeks. Once Hannah was over the shock, she cuddled with her father under his quilt and they watched television for hours. After much discussion, it was finally decided, by Ozzy, that the meeting would best be handled by two white guys. He sent Moss Jr. and Marshall Prather, Stewart's closest friend in uniform. They called ahead, and Earl Kofer was waiting for them outside under the sourwood tree late on Thursday afternoon. After each lit a cigarette, Earl said, so what's up? Cecil, Moss Jr. said. Jake identified him, pretty stupid move, Earl, and it complicates matters for you and the family. Don't know what you're talking about. Brigance ain't the brightest guy in town so obviously he's mistaken. Prather smiled and looked away. Moss Jr. would do the talking and continued, okay, whatever you say. Aggravated assault carries 20 years in prison. Not sure if they can make it stick, but hell, even simple assault can get the boy a year in the county jail. Judge Noose is really pissed about this and would probably throw the book. Throw it at who? Right. Jake's not pressing charges, not now anyway, but he can always do it later. Statute of limitations is something like five years. Plus he can sue in a civil court, judge Noose again, and collect money to cover his medical expenses, money I'm sure Cecil doesn't have. Am I supposed to be getting nervous? I would be. If Jake decides to pull the trigger then Cecil is off to jail and bankrupt to boot. It ain't smart to fool with a lawyer like that, Earl. You boys want a drink? We're on duty. Please pass this along to your son, both sons, cousins, all the clan. No more mischief, Earl, you got it. I got nothing for you. They turned and walked back to their patrol car. Chapter 35 For lunch Friday, Jake managed to choke down a bowl of mushy pea soup. Chewing was still uncomfortable and solid foods were out of the question. Afterward, Carla and Hannah left to spend the afternoon shopping and doing girl stuff, and as soon as they disappeared Jake called Portia and asked her to stop by. Immediately, she arrived 45 minutes later and, once over the shock of his battered face, followed him to the dining room where they spread out a stack of files she had brought. They covered his current cases and upcoming court appearances and made plans to deal with his brief absence. Anything new? He asked, almost afraid of her answer. Not really, boss. The phone's been ringing but it's primarily friends and old law school buddies checking on you. You have some nice friends, Jake. A lot of them want to drive over and say hello. Not now. They can wait. Most of them just want to see how bad I got my butt kicked. Pretty bad. I'd say. Yes, it wasn't much a fight. And you're not pressing charges. No, that decision has been made. Why not? I mean, I've talked to Lucian and Harry Rex, at length, and we agree that you should go after these thugs, teach him a lesson. Look, Portia, that decision is behind me. 
I don't have the mental or physical energy to pursue Cecil Kofor right now. Have you been to the jail? No, not this week. I'd like for you to stop by every other day and spend an hour with Drew. He likes you and needs a friend. Don't talk about the case, just play cards and games with him and encourage him to do his homework. Carla says he's studying more. Will do. When are you coming back to the office? Real soon, I hope. My nurse is a Nazi and my doctor's a hard ass, but I think he'll release me next week when he takes out the stitches. I had a long chat with Noose yesterday and he's pushing me to make a decision on insanity. I'm inclined to notify him and dire that we plan to go with Monoton and argue our client did not appreciate the nature of his actions. Your thoughts? That's been the plan all along, right? Sort of. One problem, however, is money for an expert. I talked to that guy in New Orleans this morning and really like him. He's testified a lot and knows his stuff. His fee is $15,000 and I said no way. This is an indigent case and the county will not pay that much for a defense expert. So it comes out of my pocket up front and I doubt if I'll get reimbursed for all of it. He said he would do it for 10. Still too much. I thanked him and said we'll think about it. What about Libby Provini? I thought KAF was trying to find some money. She is and she knows a lot of doctors. I'm leaning on her. Noose asked about a continuance, said we could have more time if needed, said Dyer would not object. I said no thanks. Because of Kira. Because of Kira. She'll be seven and a half months along by August the 6th and I want her pregnant when she takes the stand. Portia tossed a legal pad on the table and shook her head. I gotta tell you, Jake, I don't like this. It doesn't seem fair to hide the fact that she's pregnant. Don't you think Judge Noose will throw a fit when he, along with everybody else, realizes that she's pregnant and Kofor is the daddy? She's not my client. Drew is. If the state calls her, then she's their witness. You keep saying that, but Dyer will howl and the entire courtroom might blow up. Think about the Kofors and their reaction to the fact that their son left behind a child they knew nothing about. Oddly enough, I don't care about the Kofors right now, and I don't care if Noose has a fit and Dyer has a stroke. Think about the jurors, Portia. Nothing matters but the jurors. How many of them will be shocked and angry when the truth comes out? All twelve. Maybe. I doubt we'll get all twelve, but three or four will be enough. A hung jury will be a victory. Is it about winning, Jake, or is it about truth and justice? What is justice in this case, Portia? You're about to go off to law school where you'll spend the next three years being told that trials should be about truth and justice. And they should be. But you're also old enough to serve on a jury. What would you do with this kid? She considered this for a moment and said, I don't know. I think about it all the time and I swear I don't have the answer. That boy did what he thought was right. He thought his mother was dead and, and he thought they were still in danger. He thought Kofor might get up and continue with his rampage. Hell, he'd beaten them and threatened to kill them before. Drew figured he was drunk but he didn't know Kofor was so saturated with booze that he was in a coma. At that moment, Drew believed he was protecting his sister and himself. So it was justified. Jake tried to smile. He pointed at her and said, exactly. Forget insanity. It was justifiable homicide. Then why go through the motions of a monoton hearing? We won't. I'll ask for one and make Dyer do some work. They'll send Drew to Whitfield to be examined by their doctors and they'll find one who'll testify that the kid knew exactly what he was doing. Then, before the hearing I'll withdraw the motion. Just mess with them a little. This is a game. No, it's a chess match, but one where the rules are not always binding. I think I like it. I'm not sure a jury will buy into the idea that a 16-year-old kid was insane. I know that insanity is not a medical diagnosis and all that, and I know that kids can have all sorts of mental problems, but it just doesn't sound right to claim that a teenage boy was insane. Well, that's good to hear. I might change my mind tomorrow. I'm on pain pills and not always thinking that clearly. Let's finish up these files and get you out of here before my nurse gets back. I'm not supposed to be working and if she catches us she'll cut off my ice cream. How much money is in the bank? Not much. A little less than 2,000 bucks. Jake shifted and grimaced and fought a wave of pain in his ribs and groin. 
You okay, boss? Great. When I talked to Noose yesterday he said he'd assign me some new court appointments in all five counties. Not much in the way of fees, but at least they'll bring in a few bucks. Look, Jake, I want you to forget about paying me for now. I'm living at home and I can afford a little furlough. He grimaced again, shifted his weight. Thank you, Portia, but I'll make sure you get paid. You need all the money you can earn for law school. We can afford law school, Jake, thanks to you and old man Hubbard. My mom is set and she's forever grateful to you for that. Nonsense, Portia, you're doing great work and you'll get paid. Lucian said to forget the rent for a few months. Jake tried to smile and tried to laugh. He looked at the ceiling and tried to shake his head. After the Haley trial, for which I was paid the fat fee of $900, I was as broke as I am now, and Lucian told me to forget about the rent for a few months. He's worried about you, Jake. He told me that in his prime he was the most hated lawyer in Mississippi, got death threats, had few friends, judges despised him, lawyers avoided him, and he loved it, relished being the radical lawyer, but he never got beat up. My first and last, I hope. I've talked to Lucian and I know he's concerned. We're gonna survive, Portia. You bust your butt till the trial is over, then you're off to law school. Jake was waddling around the patio late Friday afternoon, in an old t-shirt and a pair of baggy gym shorts, barefoot, trying his best to stay mobile and active and stretch his legs, as per the physical therapist, when he heard a car door slam in the front drive. His first impulse was to hustle back inside so no one would see him. He was almost to the door when a familiar voice said, Hey, Jake. Carl Lee Haley appeared from around the hedge and said, Hey, Jake. It's me, Carl Lee. Jake tried to smile and said, What are you doing here? They shook hands and Carl Lee said, Just checkin' on you. Jake waved at the wicker table and said, Have a seat. They settled into chairs and Carl Lee said, You look awful. Yes, I do but at least I look worse than I feel. An old-fashioned ass-kicking, that's what I hear, you gonna be okay, sure, Carl Lee, already on the mend. What brings you into town? I heard the news and I'm worried about you. Jake was touched and wasn't sure what to say. So many friends had called and sent flowers and cakes and wanted to stop by, but he had not expected to hear from Carl Lee. I'll be fine, Carl Lee. Thanks for being concerned. Is Carla here? She's inside, with Hannah. Why? Say, look, Jake, I'll get right to it. When I heard about this I got really upset, still am, ain't slept much this week. That makes two of us. Rumor is you know who did it but you ain't gonna press charges. That right. Come on, Carl Lee. We're not going there. Here's the deal, Jake. I owe you my life and I've never been able to do much in the way of saying thanks. But this really pisses me off. I got some friends, and we can even things out. Jake was shaking his head. He remembered the many hours he'd spent with Carl Lee in jail as his trial approached, and the awe and intimidation he'd felt at being in the presence of a man capable of such raw violence. Carl Lee had shot and killed the two rednecks who'd raped his daughter, then walked through their blood and drove home to wait for Ozzy to come get him. Fifteen years earlier he'd been decorated in Vietnam. It's not going to happen, Carl Lee. The last thing we need is more violence. Jake, I won't get caught and I swear I won't kill anybody. We'll just give the dude a little of his own medicine, make sure it don't happen again. It's not going to happen again, Carl Lee, and you're not getting involved. Believe me, it would only complicate matters. Give me his name and he'll never know what hit him. No, Carl Lee, the answer is no. Carl Lee clenched his jaws, nodded his disapproval, and was about to press on when Carla opened the door and said hello. On Sunday, the old Mazda with a rebuilt transmission parked in the lot beside the jail and Josie got out. As bad as Kira wanted to see her brother, she knew she could not go inside. She rolled down the windows and stuck her nose in a paperback Mrs. Golden had given her two days earlier. Josie checked in at the desk where Mr. Zack welcomed her back. She followed him down the hall and he unlocked the door to Drew's cell. She stepped inside and he locked the door behind her. The defendant was sitting at his small table, his textbooks stacked neatly in the center of it. He jumped to his feet and hugged his mother. 
They sat down, and Josie opened a paper bag and pulled out a bag of cookies and a soft drink. Where's Kira? He asked. Outside, in the car. She can't come in anymore. Because she's pregnant. That's right. Jake doesn't want anyone to know. He popped the top and chewed on a cookie. I can't believe she's gonna have a baby, Mom. She's only 14. I know. I had you when I was 16 and that was way too young, believe me. What'll happen to the baby? We're putting him up for adoption. Some nice couple will get a beautiful little baby boy and he'll be raised in a fine home. Lucky him. Yes, lucky him. It's about time somebody in this family caught a lucky break. He's not really part of the family, is he, Mom? I guess not. It's best if we just forget about him. Kira will heal up nicely, be as good as new, and start school over in Oxford. No one there will ever know she had a baby. Will I ever get to see him? I don't think so. Jake knows a lot about adoptions and he thinks it's best if we never see the baby, says it only complicates things. He took a sip and thought about this. You want a cookie? No thanks. You know, Mom, I'm not sure I want to see that kid. What if he looks like Stuart? He won't. He'll be as beautiful as Kira. Another sip, another long pause. You know, Mom, I'm still not sorry I shot him. Well, I'm certainly sorry you did. Otherwise you wouldn't be in here. And otherwise we might all be dead. I want to ask you a question, Drew, one that's been on my mind for a long time. Jake wants to know the answer too but he hasn't asked you, not yet anyway. Kira says you did not know that Stuart was raping her. Is that true? He shook his head and said, I didn't know. She didn't tell anybody. Looking back, I think Stuart waited until there was nobody else around the house. If I had known I'd have shot him sooner. Don't say that. It's true, Mom. Somebody had to protect us. Stuart was gonna kill all of us. Hell, I thought you were dead that night, and I guess I just went crazy. I didn't have a choice, Mom. His lip quivered and his eyes watered. Josie began wiping her eyes as she looked at her pitiful little son. What a tragedy, what a mess, what a screwed up life she had led her children into. She carried the burdens of a hundred bad decisions and ached with the guilt of being such a rotten mother. He finally said, Don't cry, Mom. I'll get out of here one day and we'll be together again, just the three of us. I hope so. Drew. I pray every day for a miracle. Chapter 36. Eight days after the beating, Jake spent a long afternoon held captive in the chair of an oral surgeon who hammered and drilled and poured what felt like concrete to fix his teeth. He was groggy and in pain, with temporary caps, and would return in three weeks for the permanent crowns. The following day, Dr. Pendergrist removed the stitches and admired his handiwork. The scars would be tiny and would add character, to Jake's face. His nose had shrunk to near normal size, but the puffiness around his eyes had turned a hideous shade of dark yellow. Because his nurse had tortured him with constant cold packs on everything swollen, most of his body parts had returned to normal size. The urologist, prodding gently, was impressed with the shrinkage. He planned the return to his office so that he could park in a back alley and enter through a rear door. The last thing he wanted was to be spotted shuffling along a sidewalk and hiding under a cap and behind oversized sunglasses. He made it safely inside, gave Portia a quick hug, said hello to Bev, the chain smoker, in her little nicotine den behind the kitchen, and walked gingerly up the stairs to his office. By the time he sat down he was winded. Portia brought him a cup of fresh coffee, gave him a long list of lawyers, judges, and clients he needed to call and left him alone. It was June 28, five weeks before the capital murder trial of Drew Allen Gamble. Normally, by now he would have had a discussion with the district attorney about the possibility of a plea bargain, a deal that would negate a trial and all the preparations one would entail. But that conversation was not going to happen. Lowell Dyer could offer nothing but a full guilty plea, and no defense lawyer would allow his client to risk pleading to a death sentence. If Drew did so, his sentencing would be left to the discretion of Judge Omar Noos, who could send him to the gas chamber, or to prison for life without parole, or to a lesser term. Jake had yet to discuss this with Noos and wasn't sure he would do so. 
The judge did not want the added pressure of having to hand down the sentence. Leave that for the 12 jurors, good folks who did not worry about getting re-elected. Add politics to the mix, and Jake doubted Noose would show much sympathy for a cop killer. Leniency would be out of the question, regardless of the facts. And what would Jake suggest? 30 years. 40 years. No 16-year-old kid could think in those terms. Jake doubted Drew and Josie would agree to a guilty plea. How would he advise his client? Roll the dice and take your chances with the jury. It took only one determined holdout to hang it up. Could he find such a person? A hung jury meant another trial, and another. A depressing scenario. He frowned at the list and picked up the phone. After Portia left for the day, Lucian entered, without knocking, and fell into a leather chair opposite Jake. Surprisingly, he was drinking only coffee, though it was almost five. Always sarcastic and acerbic, he was in a good mood and almost sympathetic. They had spoken twice on the phone during the convalescence. After some light chatter he said, Look, Jake, I've been here every day for the past week, and it's obvious the phone is not ringing as it should be. I'm worried about your practice. Jake shrugged and tried to smile. You're not the only one. Portia has opened four new files in the month of June. This place is drying up. I'm afraid the town's turned against you. That, and, as you know, it takes a certain amount of hustling to stay in business. I haven't been doing much of that. Jake, you've never asked me for money. Never thought about it. Let me tell you a secret. My grandfather founded First National Bank in 1880 and built it into the biggest bank in the county. He liked banking, didn't care for the law. When my father died in 1965, I inherited most of the stock. I hated the bank and the men who ran it, and so I sold out as soon as I could. Sold it to commerce over in Tupelo. I'm no businessman but I did a smart thing, one that still surprises me. I didn't take cash because I didn't need it. The law office was hitting on all cylinders and I was busy, right here at this desk. Typical bank, commerce got itself sold and merged and all that, and I hung on to the stock. It's now called Third Federal and I'm the second largest stockholder. The dividends roll in every quarter and they keep me afloat. I have no debts and don't spend much. I heard you saying something about refinancing your mortgage to get some cash. That's still in the works. Not really. The banks here said no. I haven't ventured outside the county. How much? I have an appraisal, one of those friendly ones from Bob Skinner, at 300,000. How much do you owe? 220. That's a lot for Clanton. It sure is. I paid too much for the house but then we really wanted it. I could put it on the market now but I doubt it would sell. I don't suppose Carla would be too happy about that. No, she wouldn't. Don't sell, Jake. I'll call the folks at 3rd Federal and get it refinanced. Just like that. It's easy. Hell, I'm the second largest stockholder, Jake. They'll do the favor for me. I don't know what to say, Lucian. Say nothing. But that's an even bigger loan, Jake. Can you handle it? Probably not, but I'm out of options. You're not going out of business, Jake. You're the son I never had and at times I feel as though I live vicariously through you. This office will not close. A wave of emotion swept over Jake and he couldn't speak. A long moment passed as both men looked away. Finally, Lucian said, let's go sit on the porch and have a drink. We need to talk. With a scratchy voice, Jake said, okay, but I'll stick with coffee. Lucian left and Jake shuffled to the door and stepped onto the veranda with a grand view of the square and the courthouse. Lucian returned with a whiskey on the rocks and sat next to him. They watched the late afternoon traffic and the same old men whittling and spitting tobacco juice under an ancient oak next to the gazebo. Jake said, you called it a secret. Why, how many times have I told you not to do your banking in this town? Too many people see what you do and know your balances. You settle a nice case, rake in a nice fee, and someone will see a big deposit at the bank. People talk especially around here. You have a few bad months and your accounts get low, and too many people know it. I've advised you to bank out of town. I really had no choice. I get loans from security because I know the banker. I'm not going to argue. But one day, 
when you're back on your feet, get the hell away from these banks. Jake was not in the mood to argue either. Lucian was troubled and wanted to discuss something important. They watched the traffic for a moment, then Lucian said, Sally left me, Jake. She's gone. Jake was surprised but then he wasn't. I'm sorry, Lucian. It was sort of a mutual breakup. She's 30 years old and I've encouraged her to find another man, a husband, and start a family. Wasn't much a life living with me, you know. She moved in when she was 18 years old, started off as a housekeeper, and one thing led to another. I grew very fond of her, as you know. I'm sorry, Lucian. I like Sally, figured she would always be around. I bought her a car, wrote her a nice check, and waved goodbye. Damned place is awfully quiet these days. But I'll probably find someone else. Sure you will. Where did she go? She wouldn't say, but I was suspicious. I think she's already found someone else and I'm trying to convince myself that's a good thing. She needs a family, a real husband, kids. I couldn't stand the thought of her taking care of me in my decline. Driving me to the doctor, doling out pills, catheters, bedpans. Come on, Lucian, you're not ready for the end. You have some good years left. For what? I love the law and I miss the glory days, but I'm too old and too set in my ways to make a comeback. Can you imagine an old geezer like me trying to pass the bar exam? I'd flunk it and that would kill me. You could at least try, Jake said but without conviction. The last thing he needed was Lucian with a new law degree causing trouble around the office. Lucian raised his glass and said, Too much of this, Jake, and the brain is not what it used to be. Two years ago I hit the books and was determined to pass the exam, but the memory is not working. I couldn't remember statutes from one week to the next. You know how taxing it is. Yes I do, Jake said, recalling, with horror, the pressures of the bar exam. His best friend from law school flunked it twice and moved to Florida to sell condos. A great career move. My life has no purpose, Jake. All I do is putter around here and spend most of my time on the front porch reading and drinking. In the 12 years he had known Lucian, Jake had never heard such self-pity. Indeed, Lucian never complained about his own problems. He might rage for hours about injustice in the State Bar Association and his neighbors and the shortcomings of lawyers and judges, and he would on occasion suffer a bout of nostalgia and wish he could sue people again, but he never let his guard down and revealed his feelings. Jake had always believed Lucian's inheritance had grounded him well, that he considered himself luckier than most. You're always welcome around the office, Lucian. You're a great sounding board and I value your insights. Which was only partially true. Two years earlier when Lucian was making noise about getting reinstated, Jake had been unhappy with that prospect. With time, though, as the studying became too rigorous, Lucian stopped talking about the bar exam and fell into a routine of stopping by for a few hours on most days. You don't need me, Jake. You have a long career ahead of you. Portia has come to respect you, Lucian. After a rough start, the two had settled into an uneasy truce, but in the past six months had actually enjoyed working together. Already, and without the benefit of law school, she was an excellent researcher, and Lucian was teaching her how to write like a lawyer. He was delighted by her dream of becoming the first black female lawyer in town and he wanted her in his old office. Respect might be too strong a word. Plus, she's leaving in two months. She'll be back. He rattled his ice and took a drink. You know what I miss the most, Jake. The courtroom. I love the courtroom, with a jury in the box and a witness on the stand and a good lawyer on the other side and, hopefully, a seasoned judge refereeing a fair fight. I love the drama of the courtroom. People discuss things in open court they wouldn't talk about anywhere else. They have to. They don't always want to, but they have to because they are witnesses. I love the pressure of swaying a jury, of convincing good skeptical people that you're on the right side of the law and they should follow you. You know who they'll follow, Jake. At that moment, Jake couldn't count the number of times he'd heard this little lecture. He nodded and listened as if for the first time. Jurors will not follow a fancy Dan in a designer suit. They will not follow a silver-tongued orator. They will not follow a smart boy with all the rules memorized at his fingertips. No sir, they will follow the lawyer who tells them the truth.
Word for word, same as always. So, what's the truth with Drew Gamble? Jake asked. Same as Carl Lee Haley. Some people need killing. That's not what I told the jury. No, not in those words. But you convinced them that Haley did exactly what they would do if given the chance. It was brilliant. I'm not feeling so brilliant these days. I have no choice but to put a dead man on trial, a guy who can't defend himself. It will be an ugly trial, Lucian, but I see no way around it. There is no way around it. I want to be in that courtroom when that girl takes the stand. Almost eight months pregnant and Kofor is the father. Talk about drama, Jake. I've never seen anything like it. I expect Dyer will howl for a mistrial. I'm sure he will. What will News do? He won't be happy, but it's rare for the state to get a mistrial. I doubt if he'll do it. She's not your client and if Dyer calls her first then the mistake will be his, not yours. Jake took a sip of cold coffee and watched the traffic. Carla wants to adopt the baby, Lucian. He rattled his ice and thought about it. And you want this too? I don't know. She's convinced it's the right thing to do, but she worries that it will appear to be, what's the right word, opportunistic. Somebody will get the kid, right? Yes. Kira and Josie are going the adoption route. And you're worried about how this will look. I am. That's your problem, Jake. You worry too much about this town and all the gossip mongers. To hell with them. Where are they now? Where are all these wonderful people when you need them? All your friends at church. All your buddies in your little civic clubs. All those important people at the coffee shop who once thought you were the golden boy but don't care for you now. They're all fickle and uninformed and none of them realize what it takes to be a real lawyer, Jake. You've been here for 12 years and you're broke because you worry about what these people might say. None of them matter. So what matters? Being fearless, unafraid to take unpopular cases, fighting like hell for the little people who have no one to protect them. When you get the reputation as a lawyer who'll take on anybody and anything, the government, the corporations, the power structure, then you'll be in demand. You have to reach a level of confidence, Jake, where you walk into a courtroom thoroughly unintimidated by any judge, any prosecutor, any big firm defense lawyer, and completely oblivious to what people might say about you. Another mini lecture he'd heard a hundred times. I don't turn away too many clients, Lucian. Oh really, you didn't want the gamble case, tried your best to get rid of it. I remember you whining when Noose dragged you into it. Everybody else in town ran and hid and you were pissed because you got stuck with it. This is exactly the kind of case I'm talking about, Jake. This is where a real lawyer steps up and says to hell with what people are whispering and walks into the courtroom crowd to be defending a client no one else wanted. And there are cases like this all over the state. Well, I can't afford to volunteer for many of them. Once again, Jake was struck by the reality that Lucian had the means to be a radical lawyer. No one else owned half of a bank. Lucian drained his glass and said, I need to go. It's Wednesday and Sally always roasted a hen on Wednesdays. I'll miss that. I guess I'll miss a lot of things. I'm sorry, Lucian. Lucian stood and stretched his legs. I'll call the guy at 3rd Federal. Get your paperwork together. Thanks, Lucian. You'll never know what this means. It means a lot more debt, Jake, but you'll bounce back. I will. I have no choice.